Jesus when you speak to me I hope I'm listening to you Let this heart of mine see What is full of grace and truth Whisper, whisper, whisper I thought I'd never hear. Show me, show me, show me what you see. You and what's right in front of me. I'm scared to take it in Is that you in front of me? Are you the stranger or the friend? I whisper, whisper, whisper in my ear Tell me words I thought I'd never Show me, show me, show me what you see. Faith is prone to fear. Remind me of your love. Remind me that you never let me go. Remind me, remind me, remind me of your love. Remind me, oh, remind me, remind me of your love. Remind me, remind me. Remind me of your love. Oh, remind me, remind me, remind me of your love. Whisper, whisper, whisper in my ear. Tell me what. I thought I'd never hear. Show me, show me, show me what you see. You and everyone's right in front of me. Whisper, whisper, whisper in my ear. Tell me words I thought I'd never hear. Show me, show me, show me what you see. You and Abel's right in front of me. You and Abel's right in front of me. You and Abel's right in front of me.
for that. Thank you for the truth in that song. I thank you for your mercy. God, we just can't say that enough. Lord, can we? We cannot. We cannot say thank you for your mercy, your kindness, your forgiveness, your friendship with each one of us, Lord. We can't say that enough. And uh, Father, collectively, as your body, we are sorry when we skip days that we don't say that. Or we just skip hours where we don't think about that because you're always there we thank you for that and uh, and pray that tonight god you would be blessed by hearing your people worship you and lifting up your name and lifting up praise for you and pray god that you would now turn that blessing on us through the presence and the power of your holy spirit in your word as dawn brings forth 
light and knowledge to each one of us, Father. Uh, you are amazing, God. And we thank you for everything, Lord. And we just lift all these things up before you and all God's people said, Amen. 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 I know the answer to your question, Pat. <laughs> we cannot say thank you enough for his mercy. Right on. Thank you enough for his grace. I know we can get an amen for that, right? Amen. 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 <laughs> Welcome back to our midweek oasis. We can call it service. We can call it gathering, but it is what it is. We praise God for every time we get together. He is here. I'd like to read our six-verse passage for tonight and then go to prayer together. Tonight we find ourselves in Psalm 13, a Psalm of David. Psalm 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long? Will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Father, we just lift up your word to you now. You are its author. We ask for you and you alone to be our teacher, our leader, our guide. Open up our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. Every one of us, Lord, go before us by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, your voice is the only one that we hear tonight. We lift this up to you now, thanking you for what you are going to do. And God's people said, amen. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? These words, how long? If you've ever had these words come from you, come out of your heart, you know how deep a place they come from. How long, O oh Lord? How long? All of us at some point have had some challenging circumstances which seem to never end. Maybe it's a long health journey, a financial situation, a difficult family dynamic. There are other types of forever journeys which just wear us down. A loss of a family member or a friend, a challenging work situation, or yes, even a very difficult church situation. These are but a few examples to help remind us that we all in some way have had long fights in which we needed an answer. We needed to know, God, will you help me? And maybe after a while, that prayer began its natural pivot from will you help me to God, have you forgotten about me? Even though we know deep down that God hasn't forgotten us, it is only natural in our humanity, in our flesh, to ask if he has forgotten us. At times it might feel that way. David opens this psalm with, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? It seems David has moved beyond the question of if God has forgotten him and merely concludes that God must have forgotten him and wants to know now for how long. This is not a foreign feeling or response, even in Scripture. Psalm 42, 9 says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? 
Why do I go to mourning or why do I have to mourn? Because of the oppression of my enemy. Psalm 44, 24 says, Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? Lamentations 5.20 says, Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? A sampling of biblical writers here, all seemingly in agreement that their difficulties have gone on so long, their only conclusion, for the moment at least, is that God must have forgotten them. Asking if he will forget them forever, why he has hidden his face, why has he forsaken us, forsaken us for so long. These are heavy words, and they carry gravity coming from writers commissioned by the Holy Spirit to contribute to this treasure we hold in our hands today, the unchanging Word of God. But these are not isolated experiences. Not for many biblical characters, and not for many of our own journeys either. So it's on my heart tonight to focus here in this space of ongoing difficulty and examine how we view our circumstances and how we trust our sovereign and all knowing Father God. We start with the author of tonight's text in Psalm 13. It clearly sounds like David fears that God has forgotten him forever. He even goes so far as to say, God, how long will you hide your face from me? Doesn't question if. He asks, how long will you? And I'd like us to try to imagine how much trust David has in God and how much trust is still required to maintain his course just to keep alive. So let's begin by remembering that David was anointed as a young shepherd boy to be the next king of Israel while there was a sitting king. This was a secret that had to be kept at all cost. And it was likely his death sentence for King Saul to find out. And then not too long after, David is summoned to the palace as a master musician to play in the king's presence. I wonder if his heart was pounding as he played to sue the very person that God's prophet said he would replace. Then begins the volatile experience in the palace, including those sudden rage moments when Saul tried to take David out with a spear multiple times. Yet, each time David returned because he trusted God. He trusted God's word. He trusted God's plan and trusted all God could see that he, David, couldn't. We know David trusted God so much, he willingly fought a bear and a lion to take back a sheep of his father's flock. Then he opts to take the fight to the nation's most formidable opponent, Goliath. David's powerful witness of total trust in God's power convinces a reluctant King Saul to send him into the battle against Goliath with literally everything on the line for Saul. We can clearly conclude David is a man of tremendous trust in God, having had that very trust rewarded mightily over and over and over again. So we should not too quickly conclude that David writes this, as he writes this psalm, he's experiencing an abandonment of this trust but in his humanity, he is pleading with God to come to his rescue. He is crying out from the depths of anguish, from suffocating and dire circumstances, because he knows God is in control. When we complain, when we cry out to God, we are doing so because we know God is in charge of all things. If anyone can break through our circumstances, it's God. We already know we have nothing to gain by complaining to someone who has no influence over our situation. So we direct our complaints to the one in charge. So imagine how David feels after multiple attempts on his life at the palace lead him to now being hunted on the run from hill to valley 
God, you anointed me to be the next king of your people. You chose me. I didn't choose this. I didn't sign up for this. And yet, you chose me, and yet somehow, in a way I cannot understand, you allow the first one you anointed to pursue me like a bloodthirsty hound. Are you okay with this? What am I missing here? Perhaps... Maybe like all of us, David had moments where he wavered in his trust and then had moments where he chose to take his thoughts captive and push all doubt from his mind. <clears throat> Surely, if God wills me to be the next king, then Saul cannot actually kill me. I will trust in the word of the Lord. But for how long did that resolve last? At some point... Days later, weeks later, months later, running for his life every night, close calls every way he turned, watching other men die on account of him, some of them completely innocent and not in his circle. At some point, David reaches a momentary breaking point in his deep trust, an exhaustion point in his humanity. Have we ever been there? I know what God has said, but how much longer can I last? How much longer can I go on? Does this sound familiar to anybody? Maybe one evening as he sat in yet another cave trying to outlast Saul's relentless patrols, David likely asked himself, even if I do survive another month, another year, what kind of life is this? Is this the life of God's anointed? God, is this the life you designed for me to live? How will this play out for anybody's benefit? How do you... Get glory in this. If only we could see how God sees this moment in our life. If only we could see how much this moment means to Him and all He has purposed to happen precisely from this low moment in our journey. In my own opinion, this end of our strength moment, our breaking point, is the cherished moment he has orchestrated everything towards. It is the pinnacle of his work in our life. As Apostle Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 12, on embracing his weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on him, he finishes verse 10, for when I am weak, then am I strong. In Christ, because of Christ, Today, we're not alone in this divine orchestration of circumstances by a great God who wants us to choose. He wants us to choose to trust Him completely. There are countless examples in Scripture, probably many contemporary ones as well. Job comes to mind quickly. We've got a wonderful study going on every Tuesday morning here, led by Pastor Wade. If you can make it, it's a time of great fellowship and intense discussions. <clears throat> they are very good discussions. But besides Job, there are many others all through Scripture. One that comes to my mind quickly is the woman with a 12-year blood disease in Luke 8. Imagine having a condition that not only incapacitated us, but also required our total isolation from society. In a unique way, we've kind of experienced a small-scale version of that over these past three years in our society. But 12 years? 12 years is so easy to read, but if, what if we had to live it? 12 years is over 4,300 days. 4,300 days in a row. No help possible. No hope available she spent all she had and no one could help her. No one could treat her. No one could cure her. At times I know perhaps we're tempted to leave these incidents in Storyland as we quickly turn the page. Sometimes I like to just make them real for us. I, know, I won't speak for everybody else. I'll speak for me. We get a migraine for three days. We're praying for God to take us home. <laughs> After a week with this migraine, our prayer now is, okay, God, you haven't touched us yet, so do I go to the hospital by ambulance or by helicopter? <laughs> 4,300 days in a row is a lifetime all its own. 
Where are we turning? Where are we turning to? What does our faith voice sound like in this moment? So tonight, I invite us all to lay our own journey of struggle or challenge over the top of Scripture as we examine tonight's text a little closer. Verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Surely you are God, and you know all of my experience, and you know best, but have you forgotten me? How long will you hide your face from me? Whatever benefits, whatever protections I have received as a result of my trust in you, I am now unable to feel or experience because of my circumstances. It feels as though you have hidden your face from me. This hiding his face phrase is so stark because the face of God or the light of God's countenance, we can say, shining on us is such a great blessing. Having it withdrawn or the feeling that it has been withdrawn can seem to so easily sink us into a space of hopelessness. Psalm 80, verse 3 and 7, Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. There are many verses which speak to the restoration and victory that comes with God letting his face shine upon man. Kind of adds dimension to that Old Testament phrase, though. And they found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God, we need some of that favor now. Save us. Restore us. Please turn the tide of this unending storm so we may have relief. Does this sound familiar? Verse 2, Psalm 13. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long must I take counsel in my soul? How long must I only have myself to confer with on my next move? Remember, David is one who regularly seeks God. He regularly seeks God's face for his every move. To seem to have the other end of the line go dead leaves him reeling with confusion and his inescapable sorrow. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Why does Saul seem to escape punishment for disobeying you all the while he has the strength and stamina and military support to hunt my life day after day, month after month? Is this some way of declaring him better than me? How long will you allow this kind of power over me and my circumstances? Another psalm captures David's view of his circumstances where he says, Save me and deliver me from all my pursuers or they will shred my soul like a lion and tear me to pieces with no one to rescue me. He's talking to God and yet describing an outcome so dire, he's telling God, you wouldn't be able to rescue me at that point. Isn't that what he's saying? Well, isn't this the same place our panic might be coming from when we, we cry out to God in this way. If you don't hurry, there won't be anything left to save. As if there might ever actually be a circumstance which goes beyond God's sovereign and absolute power and authority. Ask Lazarus where he was when he heard his name called out. But from the depths of our struggle... It can certainly feel all hope of a viable outcome is quickly slipping away. This is never the case with God, though. God retains all authority over all circumstances and all outcomes, no exceptions. Continuing in our text, Psalm 13, 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, and lest I sleep the sleep of death. Consider and answer me, O Lord. This cry sounds like a refusal to be forgotten. I cannot let you forget about me. David penned this in other words as well. 141, 1, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me, or hurry up. Give ear to my voice, or listen to me. 
when I call to you. Psalm 5.1, give ear to my words or listen to my words. O Lord, consider or pay attention to my groaning. And here back here in Psalm 13.3, David is saying, pay attention to me and answer me, O Lord. This might sound rather bold, even presumptuous maybe at first glance. How does the man created after God's own heart with all his own flaws and humanity seem to assume a position speaking words that sound like they are directing or even commanding God? There is a recurring voice here in so many of David's laments or writings which cry out to God that I think it's important for us to read and understand them. While David's words do at times appear to sound like he's attempting to command God, I think it's helpful to view his words in the same way we might call out to a best friend, someone we already know we can trust, someone we already know can deliver the relief, someone we already know has proven they can be counted on, has already shown they keep their promises. The words of authority David uses with God are not the words of someone who commands a genie, let's say, but one who deep down has absolute trust in the words and the promises of his creator. I've done all that you've instructed me to do. I'm standing right here because I have followed you every step of the way. Since you are the Almighty, I know my current circumstances have not escaped your knowledge. You also know that I am human and I have limits to what I can bear. And I know you know those limits. So here I stand, waiting for you, trusting in your timing, trusting in your way of deliverance. But it still hurts. The pressure is building. I can't last much longer, and you know, I know you hold the answer in your hands. So when you get done with whatever it is you're working on, I'll be standing right here where you told me to be, waiting on that deliverance. Continuing in verse 3, light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Light up my eyes, or literally put brightness into my eyes. In other words, cheer me up before I surrender to death's power. If I don't receive some sign from you that you have not forgotten me, that you hear me, that you have my deliverance on its way, then all I have left to do is await my demise. At least for the moment. This is a true sense of hopelessness captured here in Scripture. David continues in verse 4, Let my enemy say, I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. If I die, Lord, without your deliverance, what will my enemy say then? Will he then be able to proclaim his victory over me who trusted in you? If you do not deliver me, Lord, but let me be destroyed by my enemy, He most certainly will rejoice that he who has slain ten thousands was killed by he who has slain thousands. In this verse, David is making a deep statement. If my enemy knows that I trust in you and that you have already rejected him and he pulls off my defeat, then he will declare that he has somehow overcome my trust in you. Perhaps... David is implying here that Saul pursues total vindication against both God and David and believes he will receive it if he accomplishes his goal of ending David. The victory of Saul over David will represent a triumph of evil over good, a victory for those who had tossed God aside over those who had faithfully served and trusted in him. In his suffering, David still keeps the bigger picture in view. He is concerned with the triumph 
of good over evil, of righteousness over immorality, of trust placed in God over those who have rejected God's direction. What a beautiful instruction for us in our own journey of challenge. We too are invited to pause and consider how God might get glory even through our pain. How God will be seen not in spite of, but because of what we are going through. Clearly there's something special in the way David laments to God. He pleads his case. He asserts who he knows God to be and what God is capable of doing. Then he pours out his heart, all his complaints, his sufferings, his challenges. And then, usually David will remind God, again, the air quotes, that God is one who honors his word and honors those who place their trust in him. And as if on cue, we arrive at verse 5. But... I have trusted in your steadfastness, steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. But despite what it looks or it feels like, regardless of how hopeless it really seems to be right now, but I have trusted in your steadfast love, your love that endures forever. I have trusted that your unending love will save me from my enemy. I may not know when, I may not know how, but I do know who you are. And because I trust you and your love and your character and your promises which cannot fail, I know at some point and in some way my heart will rejoice when you rescue me. I just want you to know, I will not look at my circumstances. I will look for you. I will not look at my circumstances. I will look for you. Another nugget I see in this first five texts is the reward aspect of our trust. As believers, we know the scripture, Romans 8, 28, that all things he works together for our good, Although it doesn't necessarily say earthly good or heavenly good, sometimes the rewards will be waiting for us when we arrive in glory. Rewards paid out in perpetuity. Boy, that's, that's an investment program right there. But accepting, accepting that God will work this all out, it's a little different than trusting that he will work it all out with our benefit in mind. We get the sense here in verse 5 that David is really saying, my heart is going to rejoice in your deliverance because I have trusted in your unending love. As, as nuanced as it may sound, I think this is really important for where we all live right here, right now, when we're given an opportunity like this to trust him. Maybe if we're more focused on the circumstances swirling around us more than on the one who holds the key to our deliverance, then when the relief finally does come, we might respond something like, whew, that was just in time. Or wow, that was way too close for comfort. But if we have been trusting him, focused more on who he is than the circumstances which surround us, we're going to feel a deep joy a deep joy in our spirit when our deliverance comes. A joy that shouts out, I knew it. I knew it. I knew you didn't forget me. I knew you were working on something the whole time. I knew your eyes were on me the whole time. There's this unspeakable joy that rises up within. And the depth of this joy will just seem to wash completely over the circumstances that we had just been in prior I believe this is the case, as David touches on here in verse 5, because our perspective has grown as a result of our trust. If only, if, if only for a minute, a moment, we could see God's perspective in this whole trial and deliverance situation. Just imagine, even if for a day he would roll back the curtain 
so we could truly understand what he is looking for in our trust. My tiny mind tries to construct a picture in order to help me focus, but ultimately I know anything I could imagine or say would fall infinitely short of what God sees when he looks at us. That's a given, and that's your legal disclaimer for the night. In my obviously finite mind, I see us as a young child. He picks up and sets on the kitchen counter. There are very specific words he tells us to give us assurance before the room changes. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not even going to move. Whether you see me or not, I'll stay right here the whole time. No matter what you see or hear or feel, know that nothing will separate you from me. And all of it will be used to benefit you and to strengthen our connection. Okay? And with that, the room begins to swirl and images begin to flash and spin around us. The sounds and sights overwhelm our senses, prompting us to reach out, reach out to grab for him, needing to steady ourselves. If we focus on what we see and hear, we will have all kinds of reasons for concern and panic. If we focus on the assurances he gave us, then our trust will be greatly rewarded when, in his time, he shuts down the spinning room. And our, uh, as our eyes readjust, we realize he never moved an inch. He'd been standing there for us, beside us, just as he promised. This whole exercise was to develop and grow our trust in him, our desire to depend upon his word over our own experience, trust in what he has told us over what we experience, what we see, what we feel. How he wants us to trust him over our own experience and understanding. And just in case you might be thinking, uh, Pastor, you're getting a little carried away with your imagination rather than the word of God itself. I invite you to join me to view such an image already provided for us in the Word of God. In Matthew 14, beginning at verse 28, this is a section of text in Scripture that your Bible may have the header on it. Jesus walks on the water. And that's powerful. But a header, that a caption that would grab my attention more is Peter, a flawed and broken man, supernaturally walks on the water. Matthew 14, 28, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Supernaturally empowered in dire circumstances. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand. But look at what has transpired. Jesus tells Peter to come to him. When Peter trusted the creator more than the created winds and waves, his trust was rewarded in a supernatural way. Only when Peter leans on his own understanding and experience of the waves and the wind, Letting his trust in the creator dwindle, does he begin to sink in the water, as would be the case in any ordinary situation. We too are invited to trust our creator more than the details of whatever it is that we are facing right now. We have to sometimes choose that trust in him again and again, maybe over and over, as the circumstances begin to mount. Isn't it though, as God is simply, it's kind of like the image of God is simply holding our face close to his, like a parent of a young child maybe, and saying, okay, now that I have your attention, will you trust me? Will you trust me more? If we knew how or when our deliverance would come, that wouldn't be trust. It would be a matter of patience, wouldn't it? Trust is saying, I see no way through this. But I know who you are, and I choose to trust you and your promises over everything I see and I hear. 
Repeating verse 5, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. David writes in verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Listen to the words of hope found here. The salvation, the relief from circumstances has not yet come. David here writes, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is a proclamation of trust in our great sovereign creator. David is saying, all this will happen because I know he will deliver me and I know he rewards those who place their trust in him. This how long, O Lord, cry of despair is exchanged for a joyful song of praise because the deliverance is on its way. And God is looking for us to make the same exchange before we see a change in our circumstances. This is where our trust begins. This is where our trust grows. And this is where his hand moves supernaturally in our lives, in our circumstances. On the Sea of Galilee, Jesus walked on the waves in a furious storm, demonstrating that he is indeed Lord of all creation. Today, Jesus invites us, just as he did Peter, to first recognize that since he is Lord of all creation, we have no need for fear or doubt because of what comes against us. And second, He invites us to choose to praise him no matter what it looks like in this moment because ultimately everything we face right now is entirely subject to his authority and his power. Hallelujah for that. Amen. Since the time of David and since the time Peter stepped out on those waves, our Lord Jesus Christ has gone to a cross and rose again victorious over sin and even death itself. That means everything that you and I will ever face, he has already defeated. Probably didn't hear me, so I'm going to say it again. This means everything that you and I will ever face, he has already defeated. Jesus is more than conqueror. He is king of all kings, and he wields all power and authority in heaven and earth. It is not possible for us to face anything that Christ has not already defeated. In him resides all victory. In him resides all deliverance. In Jesus Christ, we will find peace beyond comprehension, rest beyond our circumstances, and victory beyond our imagination. The question remains, after we have asked, how long, O Lord, Will we then choose to place our complete trust in him over whatever we see and hear? And one day, we shall see this verse 6 in a new light. As we praise him for all eternity, he who has paid our sin debt, clothed us in his righteousness, and carried us home to our eternal reward. I will sing to the Lord forever because he has dealt bountifully with me. He has dealt bountifully with each and every one of us. Every one of us. He came. He lived. He suffered. He died. He resurrected and ascended to give us eternal life and to prove to us his love and overcoming power. Our great Savior invites us all to completely trust him today. What a wonderful Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah, to God be all glory forever and ever. Father, we love you and just lift up this evening too, lift up your word too. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your love and all that you've done for us. Lord, help us as your people individually and collectively to trust you and to trust you more. We lift this up to you now in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.
You caught me off guard there, Don. It's the first rule, you keep praying until the guitar player is ready, right? In my heart, be the wind in this 
sins Be the reason that I live Jesus, Jesus First verse one more time Jesus, be the center Be the center Be the same. 